Hey guys, we're up here at the Fisherman's View Sandwich Boat Basin at the mouth of the east end of the canal. Over our shoulders, sitting up here at Cape Cod Bay with Captain Tyler McAllister on board the Cynthia C Squared. Hang with us, this is gonna be an excellent shoot, guys. I'll tell you what, it's gonna be uh, something that we have not done before and something that's extremely unique. So uh, I think it's gonna be a really cool shoot. In today's show, we're going behind the scenes of a commercial fishery, one that selectively harvests tuna with a traditional method of fishing that requires both precision and patience. Today, our crew is aboard a stick boat with Captain Tyler McAllister setting out in search of giant western Atlantic bluefin. My name is Tyler McAllister. I'm fishing on the Cynthia Sea Square to 38 Holland and equipped with power and pulpit, which were built by All Cape Welding down in Hannes. They did an unbelievable job. We're headed up north on a stell wagon looking for giant tuna. I think a combination of the weather and the tides have made the fish very difficult to catch. Today's a perfect day, light west wind, We're supposed to come around light southeast in the afternoon. Last time we were out, we did find a good number of fish up feeding in the mackerel, the herring, and the sand eels, making it rather difficult to catch with a harpoon. But hopefully today, they'll square up and run. Tyler's spotter plane soars over Provincetown in order to catch up with the Cynthia C Square. We just turned to the east. Modern square here. Once he does, they waste no time in getting to work. Okay, come over to your 11 o'clock. Turn that tide rip at about two and a half boats. 11.30. number of fish that I was seeing back in like 2008, 2009 was, was unbelievable. And you have another massive year class yeah, of young bluefin coming into the population, which is very encouraging, really which means, encouraging. you know, we, we worked hard. There was a lot of work and effort to re recover the bluefin. Uh, a lot of fishermen, you know, had to stop fishing or we had, you know, very tight quotas. and. Um, so now we're starting to, to benefit Enjoy from that effort. That. Yeah. Uh, like, how are your regulations different from those of a recreational angler? Well, the biggest one is size class. Yeah. We can't keep a, retain a fish under 73 inches. Yeah. How many can you hang? How many fish can you? Can uh, you last hang? year was five a day. Okay. And the year before that, it was four. What's you the know, average though? You go out there. I would you say get two. two. Is two. You get two yeah, fish. You're two doing fish, Two fish a trip this this year. I'm um, just coming. Turn a little more north and east at this point, but they definitely were two in a fish, and there was definitely two bunches, so that's what I got right here. The last couple of years, there's been a lot more herring around, too, which is a very good indicator that, you know, the, the herring is recovering. There was a big question as to what happened to the herring. What's that? <laughs> Spraying white or a little bit? Uh, swimming white. 2.30. I thought I saw a whale floating around over in there too. Yeah, I might have been. Yeah. 
710, 153, a couple of bunches of quite good sized jumpers here. Um, encouraging. Despite the basking sharks' intimidating appearance, they are actually filter feeders that feed on zooplankton and other tiny prey. A pot of tuna is falling closely behind the basking shark, likely to feed on the sea herring that are also feeding on the plankton. Got collar on the fish! Right, right, right! Captain McAllister's home port of Mattapoisett is more than just a harbor in Buzzards Bay. Its yesteryear charm contains remnants of the town's past, including its deep roots in the fishing industry. Inside Mattapoisett's oldest church, the historical museum preserves relics of the town's past and offers visitors a glimpse of the town's ties to the sea. Buzzards Bay and Cape Cod are widely considered the harpooning capital of the Western Atlantic. And the museum's collection includes F. Gilbert Hinsdale's original patent for the oscillating spear tip. Although the harpoon as a fishing method has prehistoric origins, it has evolved as a modern fishing method that still exists today. Stay right there. I'll let you know. What are you going to do now, Jeff? What are you going to do next? left. That's right. Put him off my starboard side, buddy. Nice fish. Real nice fish. He's not going to have a mark on him, either. Harpooning is highly selective, as it allows the fishermen to choose which particular fish they harvest and tuna harvested by a harpoon is coveted by seafood buyers, as the electrically charged harpoon renders a giant bluefin lifeless on impact, minimizing resistance and preserving the quality of the tuna meat. Nice head shot. 
Oh, good. Reset my zapper too when you're just off it, okay? Yeah. You like when that fish zap? All right. How long? 81? 81 and a half. The crew wastes no time in getting back to work, as every hour of sunlight out here has the potential of being productive. So where we're, where we're fishing right now, we're in the deep water, pretty, a pretty good distance northeast of Provincetown. And these fish feed primarily on herring. The bait recovery has been very dramatic in the last three years. The macro population on Stellwagen now is it's like nothing I've ever seen. I've been doing this over 30 years. Fish feed in the morning nearby, and they seem to want to swim east over the course of the day. So we'll continue east chasing the bunches. And then just about sunset, they turn back around. They start heading back right into the sun to the west, making it very difficult to catch with the glare. School of tuna fish is very much like a iceberg. What you see oftentimes is just a small portion of the school, and you could be running over fish long before you get to they that spoke, bond. They're taking and then it they just they spook, and you, yeah. you you wonder if it's a boat. But the reality is, you probably had some fish down 25, 30 feet where you couldn't see them, and they were just taking the whole school with them. About this time every year, fishing, fishing, that's all I can hear. Fishing, fishing all the time with a long cane pole and a fishing line. Yeah, they go to the lake and they fish all day. Same old story, the big one got away. That big fish gets luckier every day. Everybody catches him, but he also gets away. But I guess they'll keep on trying. But what's the use? They couldn't even fry him. Although McAllister and his crew share many of the same techniques as the old industry, their understanding and respect for the bluefin stock's well-being is exponentially greater. So one of the cool things about the Raymarine Hybrid Touch E-Series is that I can actually download ray control onto my phone. So when I'm up in the tower, I can check on my instruments, my location, even more importantly, I can check on the fish finder, water temperature, so I can monitor you know, where we're at and what the water temperature is, because that's pretty critical for harpooning. Once you get above 70 degrees, it's, it's more and more difficult to harpoon the fish. If it weren't for today's technology, the search for bluefin tuna would be quite a bit trickier. But even the newest technology in a spotter plane overhead doesn't ensure success. There is an art to the fishing method, a significant knowledge that Captain McAllister has amassed over the years. Probably seen eight different spots of jumpers at 674 and 170. Yeah, okay. All right, I guess outside, like 590, 130, there's some way out. I see a few there. I got this fish everywhere. I see him jumping here, too. I'm on the 210 line, 605, 210. Yeah, I got you. And, uh, you know, west of me there, five, you know, 50 numbers or so. The guys are chasing him around and, uh, you know, jumping. So there's fish west of us, too. Yeah, I got you. All right. Out on the water, there's an incredible sense of camaraderie among the fleet. Everyone seems eager to lend a helping hand. Whether it's updates on the school's position or sending over a batch of cheeseburgers. There you go, now you're cooking. There you go. Hi, Jack. How you doing? Sounds like you guys Surprise. got close. I've had four throws, two were legit. But nothing is guaranteed when pulling up on a tuna pod and when every missed throw means a missed chance at thousands of dollars. 
the hunt can get disheartening. Really? How many shots do you actually take to get a fish? Because I think sometimes people think there it's just like one for one. Oh, he stuck one. Oh, There's a know. lot more ocean than bluefin out yeah. there. So it depends. It depends. For you know, you have a day where the fish are quote unquote numb yeah. and they're easy to get on. You could, you know, you could be done real quick. I've had those days. So I've yeah. literally 20, 25 minutes and I've got my limit. I'm going home. Um, other days where the fish are spooky and I call them frustration throws. You just, right. it's, it's like you see them, you're getting close, you're getting close, and then they go and you just throw the harpoon because you're so frustrated yeah, because right. you can't get anywhere near them. Um, so you might wind up throwing 15, 20 times in a day, which isn't good for the shoulder. I feel it when I get home. It's, it's all about the fish. It's yeah. all about how they're gonna, it's all about what, the conditions too. You could have greasy calm, very, very what flat calm. What ideal conditions? A nice light sea breeze. You know, so you get a six, seven knot ripple sea bays with, a, with a, just a little bit of a ripple, ripple in the water the seems to be the best. But I've had them, you know, on two footers. Once it gets a foot and a half to two feet and a lot of white, it, the, there's so much noise in the water, it's very hard to determine what's a tuna fish from then yeah, on and what's, right. a, and what's not. And the noise in the water probably helps you as far as getting up on their backs. But it hurts you as far as yeah. That when I say shot. noise, I mean white caps yeah, exactly. and waves, right. and you know, because you're looking for waves. You're looking for an odd wave in, in the chaos of the ocean. Then that hopefully is a tuna fish swimming along just under the surface. We're following Captain Tyler McAllister aboard the Cynthia C Squared as they cruise off Stellwagen Bank in search of giant bluefin tuna. Coming around, coming, 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 coming. Keep working our way to the west. <laughs> They've had a slow day so far, but with promising news from their spawner plane, there could be enough light left in the day to put one more fish on the deck. So a lot of people have asked me what I get paid a pound for bluefin. And they're rather surprised when I say $7.50 a pound on average. I track the price of the fish over the course of the season. And if you watch the market, you know, the occasional fish will do very well. A lot of hype is made about the fish that sells for a quarter million dollars in the first of the year in Japan, which is that, for many who don't know, is actually a, a sign of good fortune and goodwill that is bestowed upon the market by a single buyer in an effort to bring good fortune to the fishermen and to the market for the year. It's a, more of a symbolic auction than it is a true auction because the fish is not worth near that money. Ugh. You said there were three things in college that, that you, when you were studying, you said you studied two years in college. What are the three things that you said that you, you, you saw coming true? I wasn't convinced. I did a literature review up through my senior year and into a, a one year graduate. And just based upon my experience, I wasn't convinced mm -hmm. that the bluefin only spawn in the Gulf of Mexico. Right. I wasn't convinced they were only spawn in, in the Mediterranean. So I read a paper from Bill Hamner, it's called um, lost years of the, of the sea turtle. And that really opened my eyes to the, the nature of the ocean. The ocean is basically a giant desert, except it's full of all these little oases. Yeah. And I began to theorize that they were actually spawning somewhere near the Sargasso Sea. It's, it's, again, it's like finding the needle in a stack of needles. Yeah, right. So I think what they do is they come in they eat, as far and as then they go south. east yeah, and they right. spawn. I, and so now they've got some tag retrieval data that indicates we've had small bluefin that just basically go off the continental shelf and live and swim around in the winter just in, in the warmer waters of the Gulf Stream and then slide back slide in shore. back up this way. 12.30, Got him! I got him! 12 now! Yep! 
kind of settling out. Turn it back on the side at 11.30, 11 o'clock. Right there! Off the boat, I'm in the clear. One o'clock at a quarter of a boat. Hit him! Hit him! Yep, dead. Back it down, back it down, back it down. He's dead. No, he's not. He's not dead. I might have put it right through his tail. He's going. He's going right under the boat. Back me straight down. Just no, it in reverse. Just leave it right in reverse. Here you go. See ya. I can't believe he's sinking everything out. Do you know what pressure that is? That was a good shot. Oh, that fish was deep. That fish was real deep. Complement her up real good. Come right over to your uh, one o'clock now. At a boat. One o'clock. One three quarters of a boat at 12 o'clock. 81 inches. What originated as the Wild West of fisheries has developed into something much more, a sustainable and well-regulated industry that is aware of its past history of overfishing. Thanks to tuna fishermen like Tyler McAllister, who understand the significance of the bluefin tuna and respect the resource, we're able to enjoy a sustainable commercial and recreational fishery while ensuring the bluefin recovery and survival for years to come.